the hours ranged from five to six hours to eight hours a day on top of school. So coming home, I would get home. I didn't eat dinner. I never got to eat dinner with my family. Um, I always had a plate set aside. Um, I ate around 1030 at night. And then I usually did several hours of homework. All right, welcome everybody to episode 25 of ITTV. My name is Scott Hasse. I am the now vice president, just took over that role on um, the last month or so of the Indiana Twins and our pitching coordinator. And today's guest, I'm just going to uh, read through her bio because it's impressive and I don't want to listen, list, or excuse me, I don't want to forget anything from it. So I'm just going to read right from it because there's a lot to it. So Rachel Luba here is our guest and she is a player agent, a MLB player agent and founder of Luba Sports. She's a former UCLA gymnast turned competitive boxer. She is no, or knows what it takes to compete at the highest levels. After passing the bar exam, Rachel worked as a salary arbitration attorney at the MLB Players Association, where she helped take a record number 22 cases to hearing, winning 12 against the teams. She, reached, she launched her own agency last year in 2019, becoming the youngest female MLB agent and starting her first ever, the first ever female owned agency. And the last little bit during her first off season as a player agent, Rachel negotiated her first contract worth $17.5 million for starting pitcher Trevor Bauer, making him the second highest paid salary arbitration eligible pitcher in history. All right, so Rachel, well, let's just jump in. I wanted to kind of cruise through that because I know you're limited on time. We only have about 40 or, or fewer minutes. So. What we're going to cover is three things for everyone watching. First one is the athlete, the, then the achiever, and the agent. So it's three A's. It kind of sounds fun. It looks fun on my notes here. But I want to dive into, because I think this will really help our athletes and open up some eyes. So we're going to dive right into, hopefully, the eye opener. I told Rachel this beforehand, that as an athlete, as a former gymnast, work ethic is pretty obvious if you've ever seen you know, inside of those gyms or those facilities. So not only were you a gymnast, you also went to a college prep school. So what, what did hard work look like for you? Because I know what it looked like for most people, but a college prep school and a gymnast, that's a little bit different. Yeah, um, I, I have a love-hate relationship with the sport. Um, that's a whole nother topic. But um, it, I mean, I dedicated my entire childhood to that sport. Um, and it looked like, you know, waking up, um, at, you know, 4.35 a.m. to go in, train, condition for two hours, then go to school. Um, I, I guess my personality, I was always, I wanted to have, you know, straight A's. Um, school was very important. I, my parents are doctors, so, like, school was very important to them. Um, and so, you know, taking the best classes and doing well was just, a, that, that was almost the priority um, so I, you know, went to school, um, and then would go straight from there to practice for another four to five hours a day, um, trained, uh, six days a week. I got, I got one day off. Um, and you know, my, the hours ranged from, you know, five hours or five to six hours to eight hours a day. Um, on top of school. So coming home, I would get home. I didn't eat dinner. I never got to eat dinner with my family. Um, I always had a plate set aside. Um, I ate around 1030 at night. And then I usually did several hours of homework. Um, I, to be honest with you, I was a very miserable child. Um, I lived off of a lot of caffeine from a really young age. And um, I didn't sleep a lot. Um, but it, it for me, it was always it was always, I had this, you know, end goal, this something that down the road I wanted to achieve. And I knew this is what it took to get there. Um, looking back, you know, there's my dad always stressed the importance of, you know, enjoying the journey. That wasn't something I really ever truly like embraced until I was older. Um, but it, um, we didn't, we don't have gymnasts don't have the most normal childhoods. That's for sure. So. Yeah. I imagine as a child, it's hard to comprehend all of that work, not seeing your family and having dinner and then normal routines of people that you're around or your friends. And then to, Oh, also on top of it's not normal. Have fun. Yeah. It's, it, that was always, I think the hard part was seeing, 
or, you know, just being around other kids at school. And, you know, if they ever, I was probably not the nicest person, like when they complained about, you know, having, you know, to be up late, like doing work, or this is so much homework. And, you know, or if they had, you know, to stay, if, you know, I don't know, they had a track practice after school for their school and it was you know an hour and a half instead of an hour and they weren't going to get home till late and you know the parents that were complaining now my, we had I had three brothers we all did sports they all you know d1 athletes so but it was tennis gymnastics swimming diving and so my parents are driving you know we had a nanny to take us to different places and it was just, I, I had little sympathy for people because I just was you know probably overworked and exhausted, to be honest. But um, I, a lot of, uh, it taught me a lot of really important lessons as well. Between swimming and gymnastics, two of the most time-consuming sports, holy smokes. Um, whew, yeah, so I wanted to ask you these because I think it's really good to give perspective because we have our athletes that come, you know, once a week for a practice in the off-season, and then we offer two or three times that they can come in. And they might be playing multiple sports, um, they might have a, a longer drive and we understand that. And you and I are not saying this is for everyone, but sometimes to get to the point where for you, a D1 athlete, a, a gymnast at UCLA, you're able to um, train and perform at the national level with gymnastics. I think it's just good to have you know, a more of a better understanding of what it really, really takes. So what was that like at the, the D1 level and the national level? Uh, you know, it's like, uh, it's fun. Yeah, I love. It took me to a lot of uh, the places I got to travel and the experiences that I got. You know, most kids don't have, and that I'm super grateful for. Um, but there's, you know, it, I think once you, once you get to college, um, at least for gymnastics, that's almost where it's like fun finally. Um, and I had an incredible coach at UCLA, um, Miss, we called her Miss Val, um, Valerie Condos Field. She's very influential in just the gymnastics world and collegiate world in general. She was one of the few coaches that um, she's big on making the sport a healthy sport um, and one that nurtures athletes. And um, she's very good at fixing a lot of broken athletes because again, the reality is with gymnastics, you peak at 15, 16 instead of, you know, like baseball, right. Where, you know, you, I mean, you don't need to start at the age of two and, you know, you're peaking as an adult, whereas with gymnastics, we're asking, you know, children to perform and to train at, you know, a level that really in other sports, mostly it's only adults are, you know, at that level. So, you know, it, once I got to college, uh, it was a lot of fun, but to be honest, my body was very broken down too. So it was, um, you know, it, there were, there were those struggles as well, but you know, it was, it was more fun competing at that level. So a lot of the, a lot of the shows that I've listened to or podcast episodes with you or some of the YouTube things, You've talked obviously about your, and we'll get into it, the baseball experience in the agency and as an attorney and everything. Um, I guess just one more question as an athlete, what would you tell or what do you tell younger athletes knowing that you basically pushed your body and your time limits and your schedule and everything to its limits and then understanding also where other people kind of normally are? Is there a happy medium in there? Is there something where you would tell people to go or what's your advice? Um, you know, I think my advice is, I think, well, first of all, at a young age, like, look, to get to the level, if you want to be a professional athlete, if you want to perform at the top level in your sport, the reality is you are going to make sacrifices and a lot of them. You, so is your family. Like everybody has to be on board with that. And again, that's not for everybody, but there's no easy way to cruise to the top. So a lot of sacrifices are going to go into that. And I think the most important thing is to, you need to be sure that the athlete themselves is, they're the ones who want it. That, um, that was something I saw all the time, at least as a gymnast, you know, was a lot of times, you know, te my teammates, they were burnt out by high school. They quit, um, because, their, you know, their parents wanted it more than they did, um, you know, and they, it was, 
I think that's what made sometimes a lot of the sacrifices okay for me was because I really wanted it, you know? And my parents always told me that their rule was they, we could quit. You know, we didn't have to, I, they were never forcing me into that sport. And trust me, there were plenty of days that I came home in tears and I was like, I hate this. I'm quitting. I'm done. And they're like, okay. When you finish the season, because we, our competitive season was January to like April, because we, we had to sign a contract and with my club that I was going to, you know, compete for the season. And basically the deal was like, you signed a contract, you made a commitment, you can quit at the end of that season. And, you know, sure enough, by like the next week I was over it and I loved the sport again. And, you know, I, I wanted to achieve my goals, but you have to want it. If it's your parents that want it, you know, it's then it's not for you. And, and, you know, being a professional athlete, first of all, it's not for everybody and not everybody gets a chance to do it. So you have to be willing to put to sacrifice and then to realize that, you know, at the end of the day, and I think sports teaches you this, that it doesn't matter how much work you put in, like, just because you put in work, like this amount of work does not mean you are guaranteed, you know, this result you put in that work and you have to understand that sometimes like it doesn't always, you know, like work out in your favor. And, you know, I, like I was going for the Olympics and I got, I ended up, you know, tearing a tendon in my foot, uh, like the year before when Olympic trials would be. And so, and I mean, you get one once every four years. So four years later, it's like, I'm already past my prime. So like things don't break your way, but like, are you willing to, sacrifice and then at the end if whatever your ultimate goal is if you don't achieve that like are you still going to be okay at the end with it and i think that's those are like the two most important things to kind of keep in mind well i appreciate that perspective and that that guidance and that advice it's, i think it's really really powerful so now we're going to switch gears um i, I said the achiever because i had an a but honestly, it's, it's, I want to put the dreamer because you talked about you had goals or the goal oriented person, whatever you want to say. Um, but you had a dream or a goal, you set your mind to it. You said you wanted to become an agent. When did you decide I want to be an agent? So I knew, always knew as a gymnast, right, that, you know, because of the wear and tear in your body, there's really no future in it um, in terms of a career. Uh, you know, I, it was always like, you know, when you get to the college level, if you do get to the college level, you retire after and you're pretty much done. Um, so I always knew, again, I did well in school and like school's important because I need to have a career after. Um, when I got to UCLA um, was when I, you know, started thinking more about it. And I, to me, I was never drawn, most people I think are drawn towards like the team side, like working in a sport on the team side. That was never, that never really appealed to me, probably just because I was an individual sport athlete. So what, what did appeal to me was, you know, helping the individual athlete, you know, him or herself. And so this idea of being an agent, you know, really started to resonate with me. And I, I think it was, you know, I well, so I lived on the same floor as a bunch of uh, UCLA softball players, my or, sorry, baseball players and softball, but baseball my first year, my freshman year and got to know them well and started learning about, you know, their sport. Um, I didn't know much about baseball. And um, to be honest, I was, you know, like I, I was like, I understood the sport in general, but, you know, gymnastics consumed my life and that was about it. Um, so I, you know, started picking their brains more and learning about it um, and just committed myself to understanding the sport. Um, and I wanted to work in one of the big four, I realized, because that's where, you know, the money is. There's no, there are no opportunities really for a gymnast, uh, you know, so like representing them because it's not a money-making sport. What do you mean um, the big four? Yeah. Yeah. What's so the, what's the big four? Uh, the big four. So MLB, NHL, oh, okay. NHL or NBA. So one of the big four sports is what I wanted to do. Um, and, you know, I connected well with a lot of the baseball players. Um, and so decided uh, to, you know, pursue that. Um, and I'm a, I'm a big believer in you can teach yourself anything if you really, if you really want it. Um, and so I taught myself baseball and, uh, you know, if like in the beginning when I was a freshman at UCLA, like I, I didn't know barely anything about the industry or the sport. And I, now I'm, you know, 
I probably understand the sport better than a majority of agents out there. Um, even just from an advanced like analytics standpoint, from a mechanic standpoint, you know, because I taught myself that and, you know, for two reasons, one, I knew as a female, I was going to have to be kind of overqualified, um, to have credibility in the industry. Um, and there was also that level of just kind of that, I think insecurity that I didn't, I didn't grow up with playing the sport. So, you know, like I, there was a, a time where I didn't even know what was considered a dumb question. And so I had to make sure I knew everything. And, you know, a, a lot of it in the beginning was finding, you know, people that I trusted that knew the sport that were willing to teach me without judgment. Um, and, and a lot of it was teaching myself on my own, you know, a lot of late nights doing a lot of research, um, and just kind of, you know, trying to teach myself the sport, but I think, you know, took a few years, but I got there and, um, now here we are. Now, was that a, for the rest of my life, this is what I, what I want to get to, because I know it's been a long road and you talked about it, um, another show that I heard it's been a 10 year road at this point. Was this kind of the end goal or was this the, the big goal? And then kind of, let's see what happens after that, you know, down the road. Yeah, it was like, sure. This was like the big goal. Um, but I've like, I, I always, I believe in you need to have, like, you should never arrive at anything. You know, there's any, t when you get close to a goal, like once something seems, first of all, you should dream so big that, you know, like they, there's like a quote about this, but like it should, people should laugh at it. And I can't tell you how many times I've told people what my dreams and goals are and they laugh. And there was a point where people laughed at the fact that I told them I wanted to be an agent, especially when they're like, you don't even know baseball. Well, like, how are you going to be an agent? Right. But, and they laughed. And I, honestly, within the last like few weeks, I've even gotten a bunch of like UCLA baseball players that I wasn't as close with, but that like knew me, uh, you know, back then who have seen my name and something. And they're like, holy, like, oh my God, you're doing this. Like you really did it. I'm impressed. Good job. They had, they didn't think in a million years that that would happen. And so that at one time, that was a crazy goal. Um, but I have bigger goals too, that are beyond that. Um, and I don't always share the biggest ones, like the, the biggest, the biggest goal. I mean, people laughed at the agent ones. So like, can you imagine how they would think about what my biggest goal is? But I believe like your goal should be so crazy that, you know, you, you got to work your entire life to get there. And so, you know, this is sure, this is like a step and it was a huge step. And it was something that I, there were points where I was like, am I wasting my time? Maybe this will never happen. But no, like I, I got there and it was funny because I, my parents even, you know, had to remind me at one point, they were like, take a moment to like realize, you know, even several years ago, you didn't even think that you were going to make it, you know, I, I might not have ever told people that, but like people close to me, like I break down and cry and say, I like this, like, what am I doing? And I had some, my parents would tell me like, Rachel, what are you doing? Um, so you know, like I had to take a moment to realize like, wow, this is awesome what I've accomplished. But, you know, I think, I think anyone with, uh, with big goals will tell you that they, when they achieve things, they never really truly appreciate it sometimes because they've already moved on to such bigger goals that like they forget how at one point that was a big goal. So I, yeah, I mean, I have much bigger, I've arrived at this one. Sure. But like, my sights are set much higher. It sounds like you're going to have an empire and I appreciate the ability to have both the unbelievable work ethic and to produce and then also be level-headed. I'm sure we're all not level-headed hundred percent of the time, but I mean, just talking to you and listening to you and some other shows, like you're incred incredibly level-headed and you have a good perspective mixed with the drive. And I think that's a really impressive quality. I appreciate that. So let's jump into the agent side of it. So I told you beforehand, I kind of want to break this thing down, um, Kent Murphy style from a fundamental standpoint and just kind of the basics here because I don't have as much of an experience. My only experience early on with um, anyone even talking about ever become a, an agent was I played in college with a guy who said he wanted to be a player agent. And I'm like, I don't even know what that entails. Uh, best of luck to you. Are you going to school for that right now? I don't know. He still isn't. I don't know if he's still pursuing that, but I'm curious to learn a little bit more. So 
I told you, let's treat this kind of educational because I think it's really interesting. And there might be people watching this uh, different ages that, that, hey, maybe this kind of opens their eyes. So let's start with the MLBPA, which is on your bio. And if one of our players is looking that, at that, I know that's not who it's geared towards. They're going to be like, what's the MLBPA? So it's Major League Baseball Players Association. So what is that? And then how did you get a job as this salary arbitrator attorney? So the MLBPA, the Players Association, is the group, um, so professional baseball players um, at the big league level, not minor league. Uh, they are represented by a union. They are unionized. So they, are, they pay dues to this group of people that they have elected to represent them on their behalf. And what happens, there are unions in, you know, I'm sure if there are parents listening to this, they will know what a union is. But for, you know, kids, they have, you know, union workers in, um, you know, like working at grocery stores, you know, those people are unionized. There's di all different types of unions. And so it's basically a large group of uh, collective workers that have that are represented their rights and their benefits and their you know what they like what they want out of their industry they're represented by a group of people that they choose and those people you know bargain and negotiate for a set of rules and terms by with the owners so for baseball it would be the clubs and the owners of the teams and so we, every four years, there's a new collective bargaining agreement, the CBA, and it's um, negotiated. And that's when, if you don't come to an agreement, that's when you either see, you see a strike. So there's, there's a work stoppage and people don't, or, you know, the players don't play. Um, so that's what kind of a quick overview of what the union is. The union, they are the ones who, they allow um, players to have uh, agents. They give, they give players the right to have their own individual agents, but the union themselves, they're the ones who collectively, they represent all the players, but then they've allowed basically players to have their own agents as well to look out for them individually. And so they're the ones who negotiate the salaries and, you know, basically represent players. Um, however, the union can choose, the, the union certifies agents and they have a set of rules and regulations. Each league, you know, the NFL has the strictest um, criteria for what an agent, uh, you know, has to be, or, you know, they have to be qualified. I think they have to have a post bachelor's degree so some sort of master's or you know a law degree or something like that in order to be able to be certified as an agent um baseball has one of the lowest thresholds of what you just need to i think graduate high school football they've had a lot of more a lot many more players were taken advantage of by agents in football so they made the criteria you know much more um you know kind of strict in order to uh, qualify so anyways, um, I ended up, so when I was in law school, um, I, I graduated a semester early um, because I wanted to graduate in December to be able to, you know, take the bar and be done by the time season started um, versus graduating like mid-season. Um, so I did that, but it actually didn't make a lot of sense because in, from an agent side, their slowest time is during uh, the season. Whereas like their, their season and agent season is the off season. That's when they've got to negotiate everything and all of that. So, um, you know, fast forward, I took the bar um, in February. They offer it twice a year. There's February and July. So I graduated, I took the February bar, I passed. Um, and then I was um, a lawyer and jobless and um, had some debt. And my parents were like, well, what are you doing? You know, you're a lawyer with no job. And I, that was probably the most stressful, uh, you know, year of my life. Um, because I had put a lot of, you know, I put everything kind of into this and I had to make it work. And I'm also not the type that I, like I, you know, so my parents and everyone was like, you know, just get a job at a law firm first and then, you know, try to get, get your, make your way in eventually. And I knew like, the second I divert, I'm not going to go back. So I'm going to stick to this. 
Um, so I was just knocking on doors for months. Um, I would go watch games with some scouts I knew, like just doing whatever I could to get a job and to convince someone to give me a chance. Um, one of the most important things that I kind of learned was uh, the importance of being an expert in something, because especially in an industry that's so saturated with people that want to break into it. Um, you know, everyone, there's so many people that want to be agents. They see the movie, they see Jerry Maguire and they're like, oh my God, like, that's what I want to do. Or they see Entourage and they're like, that's what I want to do. And let me just tell you, like, it's not Entourage. It's not like that. Um, but it's really difficult to do. And so you have to, like, I got offered a, I almost, I was down to the last two and they ended up offering it to this other guy, but to, for this internship to actually be Brody, Brody Van Wagenen, his assistant, um, when he was at CAA. And so I would move to New York city and they let me know that, um, the, I would be an assistant and it, they pay assistants $13 an hour. And so for a lawyer in debt, a lawyer, like I am a lawyer and I would be moving to New York city to, I'd have to live in New York city and you're working like ridiculous hours, but I'm making 13 an hour. Like you can barely survive off of that. And so that was kind of a reality check too, of like, you could be a lawyer, but like, it means nothing. You start at the bottom. Unless then I got this, I, I knew like, if I can become an expert in an area that a lot of agents don't really understand, then I have a shot. Like I have a way to maybe fast track it or kind of, you know, cut in and be a little ahead of just starting at the bottom. So during law school, I competed in this. They have Tulane puts on a salary arbitration competition. I won't bore you with the details what salary arbitration is. Um, it's, but other than when, after your first three years of playing in the big leagues, you are still controlled by the team for another three. But during those last three years, you get to negotiate your salary with the team. So it's only with that team that owns you, but you get to negotiate it. So that's what salary arbitration is. So they, if you don't agree to a salary, um, there's a deadline. It's like the first week or second week every year in January. Then you have to go to an arbitration hearing where you basically, you make your case for why I deserve to be paid this amount. The team sits on the other side of the table. They make their case um, as to why you do not deserve to be paid that amount and you are only worth this amount. And there's a panel of arbitrators, three of them. They're like judges. And they decide at the end, you make your case. They spend 24 hours going over it and they return a decision. And the decision is either the salary you submitted or the salary the team submitted and that's what you're paid so they have attorneys on both sides the MLB office has attorneys and as well as the union that basically help agents you know make the put on these cases and you know advocate for the players um, so I ended up like convincing when I did the competition in law school I met one of the like attorneys that does this for the union for the PA uh, I convinced him to give me a job doing anything like arbitration related. Um, he was like, well, I need help with like, I want to build a database of all the cases um, just so that I can have it easy, like on file. And I was like, perfect. It was the best experience because he literally just file dumped me every case that has ever been argued. So there's no better way to learn like, cases than to have to go through and make a database from the beginning of salary arbitration ever till present. And so I got to see how every agency argued salary, like in their cases, how, you know, the, every team has argued all the different arguments that are made. And I was such a geek. I loved it. It was so much fun. I made this database. I also, you know, like I kind of went above and beyond of like how I just, I was like, we could come up with a formula of like predicting arguments, like all this stuff. So I did that. Then that ended up, uh, I did that for a few months uh, remotely. And then he told me, it was like, there's a position opening up at the union. They need another lawyer to help with arbitration. And now you have basically a ton of experience vis-a-vis -vis this, database you just built so you know apply and I did I got the job and then ended up um working as an attorney and we had that year we had the record number 22 hearings in three weeks so we did double days of hearings um that was the longest like three weeks of my life but uh it was an incredible experience so so 
fast forward, now you started your own agency, you're an agent, you've passed that test, because there's a test for that, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep, so what is something, because I know you're trying to do things a little bit differently with your, your structure of how you do it, um, but what's something that players, when they reach out to an agent or find an agent or work with an agent, that they don't know to look for or that they should be looking for or something that they're just maybe not aware of? What advice would you give to a player? So I think one of the, I guess there are a lot of things, but to me, it, it always fascinates me with like how, um, you know, agents will, they market themselves and I understand why, but you know, like, oh, we represent this, this, this player, or, you know, we've done, we've done Clayton Kershaw's contract or we've done John, John Collar Stan's contract or, you know, whoever it is. And, you know, while that's all like good and well, it, it doesn't necessarily mean any, like, those are great players. And so those contracts, they, you know, like, that doesn't mean that if you're, you know, an average MLB player, that just because that agent represents, you know, Stanton, that he's going to get you a Stanton contract. Like, you have to be a Stanton caliber player. Um, so a lot of it, to me, I almost think it, like, I, I would... I would caution against jumping into an agent just based on, you know, the top tier talent that they represent. I think a lot of times it's really helpful to talk to other players that are represented by that agent, because a lot of times you'll find that players aren't very happy with their representation. Um, they, you know, you're promised a lot of things. If agents are very good. They're more or less salesmen. Like they're great at selling you a whole bunch of things that they can do for you. But, you know, I think it's important to really look at what have they done. And, you know, and again, that's both in terms of contracts and off the field stuff. Um, you know, I think, you know, an agent, a lot of times too, it's, it's more of the, the ratio of, you know, how many people work for them that can service you versus their client list. Because let me tell you, if they represent all the top players and you are not a top player. I mean, there was a point where I'll be honest, like Trevor Bauer, he was with Wasserman. It's a big agency. Trevor Bauer is like a pretty big name. Um, he wasn't even like their priority. He like, they, they had Stanton, they had Kenley Jansen, like they have big names. Trevor is much lower on the totem pole. And so the attention, he didn't always get the attention that he wanted. So a lot of times, you know, the, an agency that, you know, they don't have to be a small agency, but if they have, you know, I, I guess that's kind of why I wanted to make mine the way I made it, where it was, you know, these a la carte services and you're paying for the services and you're paying based on the work that's being done because it allows me then to, you know, keep the ratio smaller so that clients are getting serviced for things that they want to be serviced for. So before I get to our last question, I just wanted to kind of touch base on what we had talked about before with the why a um, player that's maybe going to get drafted or is drafted or is a minor leaguer might not want to invest a ton of money in an agent, why they might want to kind of do their own thing. Yeah, so um, the, you will get players, players will get recruited so young now. Um, and the reality is actually, so Bauer was drafted in 2011, uh, him and Garrett, same year, uh, one and three, they got drafted. And that was the final year that they offered major league deals for players in the draft. So Trevor took a major league deal. So he was on this major league deal. Um, I won't like bore you with the details on how that works, but, but an agent is helpful in that because they can negotiate the deal based on kind of where you go in the draft. That was the last year they did it. Now that is no more. Like you get slotted and it's, there's very little that an agent really does in the draft. Um, there's cases where it can help, but you know, look outside of, I mean, there is in general, there's very little an agent will do for you in the draft. You kind of get slotted and you kind of go where you go and there's not a lot of ability to get creative and, you know, to, you know, change your value. So, and then you go through the minor league system and the agents, like you make no money for an agent then. So not only do they not have a lot of incentive to do work for you, you know, they like, 
they're not going to spend a lot of time and resources on you because unless you're like a top prospect, but even then, because obviously they want to ensure that they lock you in long term. Um, so when you do sign that big contract, they get it, but you know, they, it's, there's not a lot that they do for you. And so like, I guess my, the way I see it is, you know, keep your signing bonus, like in the draft, you know, you don't necessarily, you probably don't need an agent. And then in the minor leagues, the thing I hear most often from minor leaders and the reason they love like their agent is uh, agents are permitted to spend $2,000 a year on a player. And so they'll get them equipment and things like that. However, if you, aside from that, like there's not much that your agent does for you, I can assure you. And you, you know, you don't talk to them very often and there's, it's not, they're not that helpful. Um, if you build your social media brand and younger kids, I think understand this a lot more than, you know, even, you know, players that are more my age or, you know, in their later twenties or they're still, they're kind of on like that cusp of the two different generations. But if you build your brand now, if you work on putting, put baseball content out there, you know, show, build your kind of baseball following, you'd be surprised how many free, you know, bats and gloves and things that companies will send you, uh, you know, because, and all they ask usually is that, you know, you tag them in a post or whatever. So you can not only get yourself free equipment, um, but you know, you're not having to, you know, you don't really need the agent. And then, you know, you build your brand, which can help you post career as well. And then I guess the reason I set my, you know, agency up this way and why it's more beneficial for players who are signing contracts who are in the big leagues is because now I can offer them a service where I don't need to charge them a premium. Um, in order to kind of subsidize for the minor leaguers that most agencies are representing, uh, who they're not making a profit off of. So that's kind of, that was kind of the thought, um, a lot of it behind it. So, but yeah, if you're a minor leaguer, I, my biggest advice is go on, like go on social media and build out your Instagram page, like put baseball, like put baseball content on there and companies will send you stuff. Super good advice that I'm sure a lot of people do not hear and have not heard. So I appreciate that. All right. So in the last couple minutes, um, I wanna, we always finish with what's called our twins critique. So it's a, an opportunity for us to tell everyone who's watching that maybe doesn't know about us, what we do, and then also kind of ask, ask the experts uh, for any advice that they have. So what we do, we're a travel baseball organization all the way from 8U up through our college guys that are returning, but our last team is going to be 17U. And then we've got our older guys training with us when they come back. But two most important things for us are number one, we're all speaking the same language. We've got a coach's certification in house. Uh, the coaches, the instructors, the parents, they all are talking about the same things, the same drills, the same workouts, those types of things. And then number two is that we're a one stop shop. So for your player fees, you're going to get all your off season training for about 20 weeks. You're getting hitting, pitching, mental training, catching, infield, like everything, all in your player fees, which sets us apart for most organizations. So with all that said, I know from your gymnastics background, your boxing background, which we didn't even touch on, um, being in the MLBPA and now an agent and seeing and learning about uh, much different other places, just any advice that you would have for us? Um, I guess, I mean, I yeah, I love what you guys do. Um, my, my biggest advice, and I'm not sure how much you guys do it or don't do it, but would be, and I, I preach this a lot, but, you know, encouraging your athletes to put their put videos and put content on, on social media. And obviously the fact that you're doing this kind of shows that like you understand at least to a degree, social media and the power of it and the reach. And I, I say this because I think a lot of times, you know, parents think that they need to spend a bunch of money on a lot of showcases too, and things like that. When you'd be surprised, I mean, with social media now, it's so easy. You don't just like, you know, Justin Bieber, I think, got discovered on YouTube just by putting out his own thing. Like, he didn't need an agent. He didn't need to go pay a lot of money to show up at, you know, I guess my point is, is, you know, even if you're a parent and, you know, you don't want to spend a lot of money, like, if you can get content while these kids are training and they just put it on, they have their own YouTube account and they just put that out there, it's going to help them with recruiting. It's going to help them, you know, with getting drafted, all these things that, you know, don't necessarily need to be done in the traditional kind of, you know, showcase way. 
fantastic feedback. Um, we actually don't push that on our players. I think they might see it, but that's really good feedback. So I appreciate that. All right, where can people follow you? Uh, so I am on Instagram um, at rachel.luba and I am on Twitter at agent Rachel Luba. So awesome. both of those places, either one. All right, well, everyone go check out Rachel and see what she's doing. I'm excited to see what those big goals end up being. So thanks, Rachel.